Welcome to Le Arte del Arme, the Bolognese podcast, where we discuss the intricacies of the Bolognese tradition with the practitioners, translators, authors, and teachers working to bring the art back to life. Today's guest is Martin. Martin is a reenactor and fencing instructor with Shieldfach Potsdam and has been practicing Western martial arts for over 13 years. Martin was recently named to the DDHF National Longsword Squad and will be representing Germany in the international HEMA competition. Martin, welcome to the podcast. Thank you for having me. Yeah, it's great to have you. Um, I think a lot of people are going to recognize you from uh, your prodigious output on your YouTube channel, uh, the Shieldfog Potsdam uh, YouTube channel, um, where you've done a tremendous amount of work um, in developing your interpretations and uh, putting them out there for everybody to see. Um, tell me a little bit about your martial arts background and how you got started in the Bolognese system. All right. So I actually started my martial arts career with uh, judo. Like I was always a sportive person and in my youth, I started uh, with wrestling basically and I transitioned, uh, tried boxing, tried Kung Fu, each for a couple of years. And when I transitioned to sword fighting, like when I visited a medieval fair and saw a couple of guys from the Berliner Rittergilde uh, show fight and reenact stuff, I thought to myself, that's it. That's where I have to stick. And since then, I've practiced sword fighting ever since. And a few years later, I asked myself, okay, how did they really fight in medieval and Renaissance times? And I looked in the internet for a text on how to sword fight. I stumbled on YouTube over the videos of uh, Roland Vazecha and Federico Malaguti and their material on 133 really spoke to me and that's where I picked up Sword and Buckler and I proposed to my university, the University of Potsdam, that um, HEMA course is really necessary for this university sports program and since they already knew me, since I was an instructor for other courses as well, that's uh, where Schildwache Potsdam really, really started. That's fantastic. Um, yeah, I was gonna, I was gonna ask, you know, in terms of, or at least context of the time, how you ended up becoming a Guelph instead of a Ghibelline, uh, and studying the uh, the Italian sources instead of the German sources. Yeah, well, so I started with uh, one thirty three, which is which is still great to be honest, but um, it's really hard to interpret. And yeah, when I thought to myself, okay, I'm not really making a lot of progress here anymore. I started to broaden my view and the uh, Bologna system or more specifically uh, Manciolino sword and buckler was uh, like just a bit I needed to get me started into a more like wholesome journey for sword and buckler. From there, I progressed to uh, Giovanni della Gocchia and to Marozzo, to the Anonimo and Vigliani and all the other awesome authors of the uh, Renaissance times. And yeah, since then, I really mu pretty much uh, stuck with the Bolognese sources as my main project. Yeah, I think that's one of the, the really awesome benefits of the Bolognese tradition is, you know, the benefit of printing um, and the concept that, you know, you can put a word count that is much higher and you don't have scribes specifically writing in books um, like in I-33 where we have, you know, instances of scribes not actually finishing pages and writing in their lines or even <laughs> even talking uh smack about <laughs> the the illustrators and saying that they drew the pictures wrong uh, for certain techniques. So um, we definitely have the benefit of, of, you know, more language and the language really helps to sort of uh, provide context and, and really build out the system. Definitely. Yeah. If, when they, uh, I think, have like the same images over and over again, and he's, he describes like, yeah, that's the thing we've seen several times before. Yeah. And here they forgot to draw the actual technique, which will <laughs> not be able to uh, we will, where we will not be able to see them later anyway, because <laughs> these guys didn't draw them. 
Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, to sort of speak to I-33 a little bit, um, I, I find I-33 really fascinating because it's, com it's incredibly complex, but it's incredibly simple at the same time. You know, it's, if they get an overbind, then you flip. If they, you know, if you have the overbind, then you go in and you do your shield shock and then, you know, cut them in the face. Um, but there's this really interesting uh, sort of pedagogical approach to I-33 um, that is really fascinating to me. And I'm working on sort of rounding out the idea of it in my head now because I'm starting to see it exist in other areas of fencing um, where you have your transitory guards in I-33 like Crook and Half Shield and the Priest Special Wards and things like that. And uh, those almost represent like an obligation, you know, like you come to Shieldsfach and you're essentially saying, okay, you're going to either bind my sword or you're going to do nothing, right? Um, so you either deal with a threat or you don't. And if you don't, then, you know, a lot of times he says, okay, then you just stab him in the face or cut him or do whatever you're going to do. <laughs> um, but then it, it's, it kind of shows us how we can really bring everything together in terms of starting from even in the Bolognese tradition starting from a wide guard and transitioning to a narrow guard to try to get that advantage um how have you seen that kind of play out in your studies yeah definitely so um after all these years i think one three three and the Bolognese system are pretty similar in certain aspects actually like one three three focuses a lot on the strata place, so like in the bind. Mm -hmm. But it has some snippets where you're told, like um, you perform your provocation or 133, it's an obsessio. Mm -hmm. And if they don't react, you don't hesitate and just step them or strike them or whatever. Much like uh, in the Bologna system where we use a provocation to uh, provoke them for a predictable action, which we can then abuse or where we move them into a worse position than before and we ourselves get into a better position. I think these aspects are quite similar, actually. The problem with 133 is that we are often not told in too much detail on how to get there. Like when we're out of distance, how do we step in? When do we raise our shield and sword into like half shield, for example? Mm -hmm. or um like what do we do if an opponent um that's not one of the things we are expecting them to do so then that's where it really gets hard this and also the uh, flattened art style can be quite challenging as well <laughs> yeah yeah if only they had the uh Murazzo footwork uh, grid down at the very bottom so oh, we could definitely. actually get some perspective <laughs> yeah that'd be great um, so, uh, you know, you were talking a little bit about Manchilino and how he was really kind of your introduction to uh, the Bolognese system, but you've also done a ton of work with Delagoke, um, and really some of the best I've seen in terms of especially introducing beginners to the postures, the forms, and everything like that, um, because you have great posture. Um, you have your your form is fantastic. Um, and now you seem to have transitioned into really getting into Marazzo. So um, you've been you've been producing a lot of content on Marazzo. So do you do you have an author that you prefer, um, or are you sort of uh, ag agnostic when it comes to the authors? Uh, well, first, thank you. Uh, it's a really great compliment and something I strive for, like good form, and actually to bring new people into our hobby, because like Dalagoki says. Uh, we have to get uh, to fans with a lot of different training partners. And that's only possible if there are a lot of training partners. So that's one of the purposes of my uh, YouTube channel. As for the authors, I don't know. I don't think I have like a personal favorite. There's like faces where I like this and that author more and where I work with the system of certain authors more like Manciolino then transition to another, then revisit Manciolino again and stuff. 
No, I don't think I have a personal favorite and I think they are all awesome for very specific reasons. Like Dialogue is great if you just want to learn single sword or really it's great for any beginner who wants to just understand why we do the stuff we do in the Bolognese systems the way we do them. Like he's really, really clear on, okay, th these are the actions you take if your opponent is in that position, much like 133 for that. But if you want to go into uh, like sword and buckler fighting, then Manchulino is great because he's very clear and precise in his actions as well. On the other hand, he can be a bit thin on the Y. So that's maybe where Marazzo comes into play, who can be really detailed in his descriptions. Or the Anonimo, when we uh, want to learn how to transition from a blade action into a wrestling action. So they're all awesome. And I would uh, miss any one of them very much if they were missing. Yeah, I think one of the the great things about the the variety of the authors is that you know we have so much material and the different styles of the different authors, so that each author provides a different perspective on how the fight is developed, um, and even when you combine certain systems, especially with Manchiolino, like looking at Manchiolino's sword and large buckler. Um, you, you have this system that is very direct. You know, he's telling you that you're fighting with a sharp sword and that you have to, you know, treat it with a certain level of respect. And then you go and you look at Murato's uh, sword and target material. Because I think Michelino says that you can use a sword and large buckler or target. It doesn't matter. He sort of uh, doesn't really care what you use in that situation. But you look at Murato's sword and target material and elements of the sort of individual techniques that Manchiolino talks about are prevalent all the way throughout Murazzo and his sword and target material. And it's like Murazzo takes the techniques of Manchiolino and just builds them out into this continuous action. Um, and so I, I just, I love that, that you you have these perspectives where you have some of the authors like Dalagoke and Manchiolino that really uh, provide the very basic progression of the techniques you know just like hey this is a this is a good way to parry parry and gordia to testa and then cut the leg right and then Marazzo's like okay we're going to parry and gordia to testa we're going to faint to the leg and then we're going to stab them up underneath our buckler you know and I, I i just love that that sense of now we're going to start to add deception and sort of these uh these other elements of fencing yeah very true it's like um the whole compendium is what makes the Bolognese system so special yeah, for sure. So, uh, you know, is do you think that um, sword and buckler is still your your favorite weapon in combination now that you've uh, <laughs> kind of gone through so much material, or have you started to uh, find a liking to something else? Well, to be honest, I pretty much love any weapon or a weapon system. I just love martial arts. So, um, no, I don't think I have a favorite. I still love to fight with sword and buckler. I still love to fight with longsword. And you get many sparring partners if you practice these weapon systems. Yeah. But I really think to understand the whole system, you have to practice and learn every aspect of it. So starting with wrestling, single sword, sword and buckler, sword and dagger, sword and cloak, two-handed sword, two swords. It's, it's just so much and so awesome. <laughs> Yeah, definitely. Yeah. And, you know, I, we were having a conversation the other day um, talking about Palladini and Palladini's advice that, you know, you should learn every weapon that you possibly can get your hands on because you never know like what situation if you're going to get called into the militia and you're going to have to stand before a captain and show him your skill, um, you should be proficient in arms, you know, and that almost feels like that's sort of the 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 core of what the Bolognese authors are teaching us with really treating every weapon with so much material um, that they really are preparing us for you know being complete martial artists and it's it's really fascinating yeah definitely and it's um 
it, it just makes a good martial artist if you study the whole system. And that's what's what really what's really awesome. You not only learn like tricks, you learn like the concepts behind them, and you learn to apply them to all situations. Yeah, and different weapons can inform different styles of fighting. I think Moreno was talking about how partisan and using the partisan really taught him to like highlighted the concept of the falsata for him as he mm. was learning you know, working with the two-handed sword. Um, and even taking like the, I feel like taking the Bolognese dagger material really teaches you how to get in close with your opponent and start to go for some of those grappling techniques and things like that, or, or do really short uh, parries that put you in a strong position and, and constrain your opponent. Definitely. And yeah, like I said, the uh, Bolognese sauces can be a bit thin on the why we do things. But uh, if we contrast the different weapon systems and which actions are used in the different weapon systems, we can somehow form at least an educated guess on why we do the things we, uh, the way we do it. Yeah. So what are some of the challenges that you've faced in developing your interpretations and how have you overcome them? Oh, well, I don't think, first of all, that I've overcome all the challenges. I don't think I have like a finished interpretation of anything. That's like more, so the process, process of interpreting for me is like, I read the text, I've, I come up with an interpretation, if you want to call it like that. I work on it a bit again, test it for body mechanics, um, try it in sparring. Then I check for uh, like um, the opinions of other peers, like on YouTube, Reddit and stuff, or in the uh, Giovanni della Gocchia forum on Facebook. It's really great as well. Um, I re revisit my own interpretation time, time and time again. I discuss it with my course. Then I maybe progress to a different weapon set and then I come back again with new insights, hopefully. And that's where I um, try to shoot the videos I make for YouTube. These are pretty much a reference point for me and hopefully a useful reference point for others as well. So um, the discussions from these videos help me to reimagine all the possibilities the text can mean once again and like really uh, sharpen my opinion and the arguments for specific actions and against them. So I think it's a, it's a ongoing process pretty much. So it takes, takes several years until I have a working interpretation and I think it will take several more until I can say, yep, that's, that's a good action. You can practice these, they probably, meant this action and you can uh, apply it in sparring in free fighting in tournaments like you want yeah yeah i always kind of think of, of tournaments being the sort of the crown of how you determine whether or not a uh, an interpretation really works you know um <laughs> because it's it's either going to absolutely destroy your perspective <laughs> on your interpretation or it's going to validate it um and uh it, it's it's a really useful tool in that way. Definitely, definitely. Yeah, never under, underestimate the importance of tournaments for one's own interpretation. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's a good way to, to you know, I and, and you have a really unique and, and very humble approach. Um, and I, I feel like, you know, because of how like finished and, and beautiful you make your videos, because you do really, do you have any background in uh, like graphic design? How do you? <laughs> so um, I actually studied economics and I work at the university. So um, where I publish uh, learning material and videos. Gotcha. So that's, that's pretty much my experience. And I think to really um, like educate people, you not mm -hmm. only have to show the stuff like 
the correct stuff, but you also have to entertain them. So it has to be appealing. And that's where uh, I only shoot stuff if I think my form is somewhat appealing. Uh, yeah, no, that's that's awesome. That's very brilliant. Um, so let's talk a little bit about Two Swords. Um, you've done a lot of material lately with uh, um, the Two Swords from, um, from Marazzo. How do you mm -hmm. feel about that material? And uh, have you um, have you done any sort of work with Manchiolino or any other of the other authors? Yeah, so um, the two sorts material of Marozzo, I think it's great. It's a it's pretty good if you're just starting out with two sorts actually, because you're you're told what your opponent does. So it's fairly easy to imagine where these uh, techni techniques are applied. So that, that's, uh, that's my favorite part about it. The actions themselves can be a bit tricky at times, but I think my current interpretation is at least good to go, good to test in sparring. Let's say good to test in sparring. That's, that's a, the next step to test them in, in full speed sparring and hopefully like in a tournament or a situation as well anytime soon as COVID permits. I've um, I've dabbled into Manchelino, but actually I uh, two swords. I practice this since since 2020, when in February uh, Jacopo Penzo held a workshop at the English Side Sword Open. So it's actually not that long of a time. Um, I dabble into Manchelino, yeah, and. I wouldn't say I have an interpretation for all the actions yet, which is really useful or really solid. But I think they have a lot in common. Like uh, the Marazzo return from play is really similar to the Manciolino entrance and the action he uh, performs several times during the play as well, like the double falsi from one side into the double true edge strikes. It's just um, different starting positions. Mm -hmm. So it's um, it's really nice to see uh, where this action, which Marazzo uses as an return from play, might be useful even within the play. So that's kind of great. Yeah, yeah, no, it is. It is really great. Um, I I agree with you about Manchilino. Um It is kind of unfortunate that we don't get the sort of B side of or the the scholar side of what's happening in his progression. Um, I, I know that when we were developing our interpretation of Manchilino, it was very much just your opponent giving you counterbinds. But the one thing that I do love about Manchilino is that there's such a concise flow um, where you almost feel like you're chasing just, you know, because you're constantly, you know, getting the advantage and then, or, or flanking your opponent and going back and forth um, with all these different actions. But Marazzo to me, in trying to apply these techniques in sparring, feels a lot more applicable. Um, I definitely find myself pulling off Marazzo's techniques <laughs> in sparring a lot more than I do Manchilino. Um, But that said, um, I think all of the two sword material is is really brilliant. Um, some of my favorite material um, in terms of of learning fencing um, you know like Palladini actually says that you should start with uh, two swords or you should learn single sword first and then you should learn two swords mm -hmm. as a way to learn how to use your left hand which I always thought was really interesting um, especially because you know Marazzo puts the two sword material um, you know I mean it's it's pretty far up in his book you know it's it's before you really kind of get into some of the other materials so you know, maybe he treated it this sim a similar way where, you know, two sword was something that he would teach early on. I'm not sure. Yeah, I think it's, is it before the Rotella stuff? I don't know, actually, by, by yeah, heart. Yeah, I, th heart. I think, um, got it right here. Go ahead. Yeah, um, no, I, I think as well, uh, Manciolino feels really great. It feels at times like uh, like a Godinho solo drill, one versus many, actually. So it's 
yeah. it's really awesome to just get to into the flow of the weapons, which is really great. And he has some pretty good advice how to react to um, the opponent's attacks. Like if he attacks on your left, always use your left sword. If he attacks on your right, always use your right sword to defend and counter with the left, which is then again, uh, the same thing Marozzo actually does in his play, mm -hmm. but he doesn't describe it like that. Yeah, 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 definitely. And to some degree, Palladini does, well, he he does a little bit different. He um, He ends up having you, so you always, with Palladini, have one sword high and one sword low, and your high sword will deliver an attack and then close the line. And then the other sword, the other hand will go high to then present another threat. And you kind of have this like back and forth with your hands going from high to low and transitioning like that. Um, but that said, there are some very similar actions, um, especially with his low parry, if they end up cutting to your leg, um, sort of turning that true edge down and off to the side. He does a similar action like that. Um, there's some pretty good stuff in there. It's very short, um, but it's it's fascinating. Uh, I, I I love it. I mean, yeah, there's, looking at there's yeah. just so much stuff to read. <laughs> so there really so is. Much, yeah. So Bologna's system isn't just awesome in itself. There are so many contemporary authors who write about the same stuff and where we can get additional insights from. So it's really great. So it's really uh, complete in its time, in its context. And so we can learn a lot of things from it. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, I, you know, I think about like Godinho's material um, with two swords and, you know, it sort of representing what you're going to do in a street fight. I, I, I find it kind of interesting because Palladini gives this interesting anecdote at the end of his chapter on two swords where he talks about how, um, you know, he has one hand high and one hand low, like Dociolini and Altoni. Um, and then he says, you would assume Marazzo's guards where your hands are together. He says like a, a two handed sword, uh, if you were fighting multiple opponents, right. But Marazzo never really talks about fighting multiple opponents. He always talks about really just dealing with one opponent, but then we get Godinho's material where you turn into like a, you know, two sword helicopter of death <laughs> and you're just like, you know, and it, I, I just find it really fascinating that you have these different perspectives on and, and practical usages of two swords. Yeah, definitely. We always talk about two swords on the battlefield and how it's not the most useful weapon. But to be honest, battlefield situations aren't and probably weren't that common in that time. So uh, it was far more likely to get into a dangerous situation in a civilian context. And there, two swords present a couple of great advantages like Manciolino and Marozzo say. Like it's a really beneficial weapon combination and has actually some advantages versus sword and buckler or sword and dagger. Yeah, the extra offense really helps. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, and, and you know, I think this is what I find really fascinating about the two sword material is that it is so bind oriented everything you know you're constantly counterbinding you know finding your opponent's sword and then coming through and then perhaps they they start to counter your counterbind so then you drop a sword up underneath create another counterbind and then come through and you might do a full cut um and from that perspective there's just so much uh complexity because you are dealing with two swords and you have the leverage of both swords and the, the natural measure of two swords, I feel like, is a little bit shorter. Like, you don't get as many wide play actions because no. I mean, if you do, a lot of times you're still counterbinding and then doing a wide play action because you still have one sword in presence, you know? And so it gives you this advantage where you can kind of string those two things together and do both, both strata and sort of um, Larga actions or, or assume Larga guards um, like in one continuation. Yeah, definitely. I think uh, in his two sword section, Marazzo is actually a bit more defensively minded in comparison to his other sections. Maybe because uh, the opponent also has two swords and that's like really a lot of factors you have to keep in mind. So 
you actually seek the bind with one sort at least to have that additional information on pressure on where the opponent goes and like uh, just to keep oneself safe yeah and it it seems like when he does attack it's very um you know through the the first portion of the book our attacks are usually initiated with a falso to the hand hmm. and and however our opponent reacts to that provocation of a, a falso to the hand then we will essentially counterbind and come through with a thrust or a cut and then later on he starts to get into some really interesting stuff where you know you throw that falso in puntanto like in the uh in the seventh one uh which yeah. i love you know you, you still get the counterbind but then you throw that falso in puntanto and then cut up underneath and that's the one where you end up cutting down around and sort of gathering their swords yeah. and then cutting through mm -hmm. um but it's 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 really i i, I think that's where um yeah, it is. It seems very safe. It, it seems very uh, provocation oriented, and more so. I mean, Morazzo does that that falso to the hand as a provocation a lot, but it feels like th that progression is a lot more just trying to get your opponent to come at you in some way, so that way you can counter. Yeah, definitely. The only time I think he closes without the falso is with the uh, like hanging parry. Like mm -hmm. where he says, um, if the opponent does that and that, you can parry like this. And even he, if he does nothing, you go with the hanging parry and then the thrust underneath or the reversal to the legs. So yeah, it's like a bit, oh, that's heresy, a bit of George Silver's true guard. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that is heresy. I can't believe you said that. No, just kidding. <laughs> Um, yeah, I mean, but the interesting thing about Mancilino is perhaps Mancilino is a bit more offensive because he doesn't give us, um, he doesn't really give us like solid defenses until, um, really towards the very end when, uh, you get your four basic defenses against a reversal with the um, or a mandrito with the right hand, a reversal with the right hand, and then a, a reversal with the left hand and a mandrito with the uh, left hand. And so you get that part at the very end, but everything up to that point is really this progression of you sort of pressuring your opponent and applying attacks, you know, and they're very similar. You know, I mean, if you were to take uh, Manchilino's uh, real first action where you end up cutting, you cut up underneath, you find their, your opponent's sword, and then you cut in, and then you end up doing that double thrust. Mm -hmm. That, that progression is not really that different than what we end up seeing from uh, Marazzo with his falso yeah. impuntanto. I mean, in terms of the concept of going for a cut underneath that then ends up finding their sword and then coming around. And he does that twice. Um, and then he gives us his thrust, which are essentially, you know, you're counterbinding with your left sword and you're thrusting over, or you're counterbinding with your uh, uh, your right sword and then thrusting behind your right sword. So he gives us these two very like real concepts of how to attack with two swords, um, and then some very basic defenses. Um, so he actually, you know, I mean, there's there's a pretty decent system there. And Morazzo, like you said, he is very defensive. I think, I mean we get what like two two attacks roughly um that are like true attacks the rest of them really kind of seem like those provocations yeah. um so uh, you know i mean it's uh it's it's an interesting sort of pedagogical approach to kind of string those two together and see how you can kind of integrate them yeah that's that's really beneficial to study both of them Definitely, and uh, for that instance, the others or the other authors of that time as well, like Docciolini, Palladini, Di Garci. These are all awesome, and we have to study them all to really understand the us usage of two swords. I think. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, I, I wish I had more time. <laughs> 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 uh, every time, every time I, I mean. Uh, I think right now I'm I'm definitely trying to come up with a solid interpretation for Palladini. Um, I, I try to 
in my personal study, I, I, I know, I mean, you've, you've done a lot of work. How do you do this? Um, so how do you really break apart your study? Like when you're, when you're going through your week and you're doing your sword study, especially like your independent study for certain systems and you're developing your techniques, um, like how do, you, how do you string that out? How do you set that up? Do you focus on one thing at a time? Do you do a couple of different things like kind of strewn throughout the week? How do you do that? Yeah, so I pretty much try to train every day in the week, but not for long. So like every day, 30 minutes mm -hmm. would be great. But if it's 10 minutes only a day, that's fine as well. We have, um, for now, two group online sessions for one hour. And this is where I present my interpretations to my group and where we discuss them. And if they're fine, we train them. So we uh, have solo drills to just um, drill these motions into our body. For my personal study time, I read the text i read all the text i can get my hands on and if i find the time every other text i can get my hand on as well um and then i just um yeah get my sword in my hand and i'll try every technique i've possibly encountered um which could fit the text at that portion actually yeah so i i really think that uh, interpretations aren't made out of thin air, but from our uh, experience. Yeah, pretty much from our experience, from all the actions we've done ourselves and all the actions we've seen others do. So that's yeah. where I think these like YouTube videos are also really great because it's one thing to describe an action or like uh, Morozzo and Manciolino do, they write about it, but it's... Uh, totally another thing to see them in action and yeah. possibly even with a partner yeah and um you know i i, I kind of brought this up with uh, when i talked to ken harding but one of the things that i love about having content um is even if you don't agree in the way that you've come up with your interpretation one of the great things about having a lots of different interpretations out there is that you always have something that you can kind of come back to to reference so you can either reference it and build upon it and then if you disagree with something you can sort of tweak the interpretation to however you like or um it gives you something to go back to if that interpretation doesn't work right because i mean we're talking about you know tournaments being sort of the, the that crown right and if you were to take your two sword interpretation into a tournament in order to fail miserably <laughs> like where do you go from there but if you have that material out there and you can reference especially from multiple different reference points to see what other people have done um it's such an invaluable resource um so you're definitely doing something that is an incredible work for the greater human community um and i think <laughs> everybody should be appreciative of that for sure um you know, it used to be that, it, you know, Ilko was like the only Bolognese person on YouTube, you know, but now we have so much material. Um, next week, I'm going to talk to Jay Maxwell. And, you know, Jay is producing really great material. You're producing great material. Ken Harding's producing great material. Yeah, definitely. You know, there's just so much great content out there. Um, and it's great. It's, it's really fantastic. So, um, yeah, we definitely appreciate you for that. Yeah. So, Thank you. You're welcome. Right. Yeah. Uh, so let's let's talk a little bit about strategy and tactics of the Bolognese mm -hmm. system. We, we talked a little, little bit about the strategy and tactics of, of two sword, but let's talk about, um, especially with uh, single handed sword. Um, how do you view the strategic and tactical approach of the system? OK, well, um, I would uh, reference to Alagokia for that probably, because um, to really comprehend the strategic mindset of the Bolognese system, I think we first have to understand tempo. And mm -hmm. like his definition is still, I think, one of the best. So the tempo, just a time measurement, like a time frame. And then we have to just understand that if someone is active and the other one is defensive, so agente, paciente, um, the a defensive action has always to be shorter than an offensive action. 
because we have to finish our defense before the strike is at our head and we have to react. So there are two things that have to happen. We have to react, we have to choose the right defense and we have to execute that defense. So, and that's where measure comes into play. If the opponent is so close that he can perform an offensive action that is shorter than our reaction span, then we have no chance at all to perform any defense. Yeah. And if our sword is behind our back or really far away, so our defensive action has to be too long in proportion to uh, the offensive action of our opponent, then we have no chance as well. So we have to get our sword mostly in front, mostly in a strata position. That's why they already recommend that. Because Every defensive action is a really quick one from a spreader position, basically. And then we have to uh, work for, for a tactical advantage to make our offensive action just that precise that the opponent cannot react. And more importantly, that from our offensive action, he cannot just also perform an offensive action that strikes us as well. So. We have an additional layer of um, we have an additional layer that we have to keep in mind. So we cannot just thrust around his uh, like sword, like uh, in in, Germ in the German tradition it would be uh, duplieren. Mm -hmm. But there have to be uh, specific circumstances for that to work. Like the point of the opponent is offline, so the pressure is sideways, like not to us. These are like conditions that have to be true if we want to perform certain actions. And it all springs from that concept of tempo. And that's really awesome. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so just to build on that a little bit um, and, and sort of hopefully further discussion a little bit, um, you know, looking at Vigiani, um, I think the first time this really clicked with me is when I read Vigiani and his discussion of tempo and Aristotle. Mm -hmm. um, and really defined what time was and saying, you know, when you cut from high guard to cut to a low guard, the time it takes for the sword to complete that cut, that's tempo, right? And that concept shows up so much throughout all the other texts. Vigiani spells it out in a very uh, sort of Aristotelian manner, which is nice because it, it definitely links us to other systems in like the European sword fighting traditions, you know, I mean, even, even looked in our references, Aristotle. So, um, you know, that's great. But then we get things like, um, you know, Michelino saying, since no blow can reasonably per be performed without ending in a guard, the virtue of a fencer is found to, in the raising and lowering of the guards. In consequence of this principle, he who renews his attack before setting in a guard will be more apt to win. This is because it's easier to attack an opponent whose action is interrupted, right? And so there he's talking about attacking somebody in the tempo of their action, sort of like what you were talking about of interrupting right. their tempo. Um, and... I mean, Murazzo gives a similar uh, sort of run of instructions in his third section of uh, Two-Handed Sword, where he just randomly starts talking about <laughs> tempo uh, for the first time in the entire book. Uh, but he starts randomly talking about tempo um, in the Two-Handed Sword section. Um, and he essentially says to do the same thing. He says to try to catch your opponent between rising and falling. Um, and we see that concept come up a lot in other systems. I mean, for all intents and purposes, that is indes, right? Yep. Um, and so you're right in that, like, and, and I, I really agree with you that tempo and measure in particular are so incredibly important. Um, and measure is something that is really hard to, for some people to understand, especially in the HEMA world, it seems like we're talking about fighting in tournaments. It seems yeah, that it's everyone... also, it's also uh, really depends on the individual. Like if you're fencing That's... a really athletic fencer, measure becomes something completely different. He can strike you in that little time from much further away. 
So, yeah. and if you're fencing with another fencer, you can maybe get a lot more closer. So it's it's really hard to get your measure right. Yeah, it is. And you know, the length of an opponent's weapon. You know, um, yeah. Mitch Chilino actually talks about that quite a bit in his introduction. Um, where if you end up fighting somebody in a duel, mm -hmm. um, if you're shorter. Make sure that your taller opponent has a sh uh, has a shorter weapon than you do when you select the weapons, and um, so we get the you know I mean this is definitely something that they were thinking about, but you know when you when you think about measure from a broad context and maybe it's more of a simplified context, how do you sort of define measure? What how do you how do you teach measure when you're teaching your students? Mm -hmm. So if I teach a new student measure, I pretty much um divided into three different ones, like out of measure, like uh, then the measure if you're like white measure, if you uh, can strike your opponent, but it takes a pretty long time and they're able to react. And then that's, that's a short measure, measure or strata. And that's where like every action counts and there's actually no time to hesitate to reference back to 133 once again. There's no time to hesitate, no time to think. If you think your opponent can already be performing his offensive action, you have no time to react for your own defense. So you have to really be apt to like control the center and then strike from there. Always um, never only think about winning the bind, but think about how you can win the bind to strike them, to provoke them or to lead to the next action. That's, I think, a thing that's really hard to comprehend for, for a beginning fencer. And like the Anonymous says, it's, um, it comes with experience. <laughs> yeah, definitely. And, you know, I mean, to sort of uh, provide a, a textual base to what you just said, you know, Manchilino says that you should never perform any sort of a parry without performing a repost. Yeah. Like, yeah. So, um, yeah, I, I completely agree with that. Um, so one of the things that you said earlier, um, I think is is actually really important and something that I think exists, uh, especially we see a lot more um, talked about in the rapier traditions, but the concept of making sure that your tempo is smaller than your opponent's tempo, um, that is really a lot of what I think the Bolognese authors are talking about, but not necessarily getting as directly to the point as later authors yeah. do. You know, yeah, it, it's like they had a they had a broader understanding and a, a better way of sort of contextualizing these things and explaining them in a simple manner. Um, one of the best explanations of that actually comes in the uh, anonymous Vienna, which is uh, a student of Fabris, but I think it's something that we see. Um, really played out throughout um, you know all the all the all of the uh, Bolognese texts um, what are what are some actions that you do with uh, with your students to kind of really focus on the tempos and teaching the tempos mm, so I actually adapted like an open hand drill from kung fu like um, just to to get to know the feeling of when you are too close to react. Both people start with their hands uh, stretched far away from them. And the aim is to touch the shoulder of the opponent. <laughs> so they both are in contact or maybe they both even start without contact. And then one is offensive and the other one has to defend by just pushing their arm away. First without contact, and it's pretty soon that they recognize that they can get a lot closer with contact than without because they have that additional pressure information. Hmm. And um, like really experience by hand, by, by practice, like Manchilino says, we experience with, by practice with our head um, how things feel. When can we uh, perform like uh, uh, a defense and immediately repost, for example? And that's a, a drill. I think it's really, which is really beneficial for both of them to just experience what tempi are 
how long tempi feel and what mezzi tempi are basically nice yeah that's awesome um so let's see what is something that you think that we as a community can do to improve upon uh to better reflect the sources in our fencing well i think we are actually on a good way like um, exchanging information discussing it's like yeah it's an academic process and that really works well through instances like youtube facebook and other stuff it's really great that people like ken ilka and stuff share their interpretations i think that's super important where we can do better well more people just have to do it. So it's really important to get new people into this hobby, to get more interpretations, to get all the text uh, filmed and recorded, get every session recorded, get more sparring footage, tournament footage, and look for techniques in that tournament which could fit the text, for example. Yeah, so that could be a, a way to find new valid interpretations. Yeah, pretty definitely more people, more time. <laughs> that's that's the greatest challenge for now, at least for me. <laughs> yeah, uh, that's uh, that's I I think I agree. Uh, that is really important. Um, and new perspectives, right? I mean, yeah. a lot of people see things from different ways. We've kind of talked about, and having more people um, really kind of share their experience. Um, share what works uh, especially validated techniques things that they really feel like they pressure tested and are working really well um, you know being able to articulate those and, and get those out there so other people can try them and try to validate their techniques will really kind of help us because i i feel like especially for the bolognese community um i feel like it's it's growing a lot right mm -hmm. now you know um yeah luckily luckily yeah but we haven't had the texts as long as you know people in the kdf tradition they've been working from their texts for a lot longer um they've got a lot of people who have been working really diligently for decades to try to pressure test and come up with their interpretations and if you talk to a kdf pr practitioner now there, i don't think that there's nearly as much indecision or sort of unsettledness that comes with what we're seeing in the Bolognese tradition. Um, we have the benefit of authors that write a lot more. So there's some, mm -hmm. there's a lot, I think there's a lot less, there's more material, but there's a lot less material that's sort of ununderstood, but there's still some things out there that are kind of, oh, uh, I do it this way. You know, I've had a lot of conversations recently about uh, what is a traversado? uh mm -hmm. what, is a, what is a falso impuntanto um <laughs> what makes a falso impuntanto and a falso impuntanto and is it different with a two-handed sword or a one-handed sword you know <laughs> um and and maybe these are things that'll never go away but um we still have a lot of things that we can sort of diligently work to kind of understand um and i, th I think we're kind of on that path but it, it will take more people and more perspectives to really kind of hone it in the way that other traditions have kind of done so yeah, definitely. It's like um, Dalagokya says, you have to train with a lot of uh, different partners. And that's because we need to experience uh, that variation, variation in techniques, in body size, in performing the actual techniques, in pressure. Just that's so important to have like your boundaries pushed far and far away to really broaden your view and yeah, to really comprehensive system. Yeah. So, what are you uh, what are you working on next? What can we expect from you in the uh, in the YouTube world? Um, okay, so right now we are still in lockdown in Germany, so we have to keep some distance. But actually, uh, last weekend I got to Potsdam once again, and we filmed some stuff with the Partisan and Rotella. Actually, as awesome. as a part uh, as a partnered exercise, so I think that's that will be the next thing in the in a few weeks, I guess. Fantastic! That's going to be great. Um, 
So have you have you looked at any of the uh, anonymous plays with uh, single-handed sword against uh, partisan? Not yet, to be honest, but that's definitely the next on the list. So I I read through it once. I have my interpretation. <laughs> for <the> <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but yeah, so it's it's still a work in progress. Yeah. Yeah, it's it's pretty cool. I, I think it works well with both single handed sword and two handed sword. Um, so I, I actually I really like that material. Um, I've yet to get through Murazzo's, uh sword and buckler against partisan stuff, but um, I think that'll probably be something that I intend to get to pretty soon. Yeah, that's um, quite awesome, actually, as well. Yeah. So you, you've done that already? You've gone through some of that material or just read yeah. through? No, really? uh, we, we've gone, uh, oh, it's, it's still in the same phase. So like, I wouldn't be able to shoot it now because I haven't sparred it enough gotcha. to be, to be able to say it with, with confidence, but yeah, I, I think it's really awesome. And I think it's, uh, it's also quite, it also uh, applies quite well to Sword and Rotella and maybe even in Brachiatura as well. Ah, uh, yeah. So are you guys gonna I and that that's something that I'm excited about because you guys made that video about making the Embrachiatura <laughs> and I am really excited to see uh somebody uh pre present some some techniques with that because um one, I'm gonna follow you guys' tutorial and I'm gonna build one myself. Uh and two, I'm I'm really looking looking forward to sort of comparing interpretations of that material because um that will be kind of um ending my quest to finish book two of Murazzo. That'll be sort of the, the very last material that I do. Um, so I'm, I'm excited to see that. Yeah, I'm really fortunate uh, to have so motivated students like, like Stefan, who is also really capable, not just as a sword fighter, but also as a craftsman. Yeah, he's made some really incredible stuff. Definitely. <laughs> yeah. All right. So. Um, Let's see yeah so what else is going are you guys do you guys host any uh events or tournaments um in potsdam yeah that's actually the plan so um last year still COVID, uh, but we had like a short one month window where we could uh host uh, a little um a little event outside like right in front of the palace which was quite awesome that's where a few of our videos uh came to place it's that's definitely gorgeous. that's definitely planned for this year as well and maybe i i fingers crossed fingers crossed uh maybe even with uh, a bit more participants from even other nations as well so we'll see but that's uh, definitely um, a regular event in our curriculum now as well and we uh definitely want to host um a side sword tournament as well. After we participated in the English side sword open, we got into contact with uh, Jay as well. And not only he produces some awesome videos on the two handed swords on the partisan Loronka as well, but he's also a great guy and he organizes the uh, Italian and English side sword open. So maybe there will be a German side sword open as well. Cool. That'd be fantastic. Yeah. Well, um, you know, hopefully one of these days we'll have to get you over to uh, the United States and, uh, and, and get you great. in some of our events over here. Um, you know, I guess the East Coast is probably easiest to travel to. So perhaps when uh, the North American Bolognese event ends up coming to the East Coast, we'll have to get you over <laughs> here because um, that would be that'd be awesome to have you here. And then we that can do some great. sword fighting. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> definitely. <laughs> uh, so tell me a little bit about your involvement with the uh, DDHF um, and the National Longsword Squad. Mm -hmm. So um, like the DDHF is the uh, German umbrella organization for uh, historical fencing in Germany. And two years ago, or maybe last year, they uh, officially founded uh, a long sword squad for women and one for men with the aim to uh, push long sword fencing or competitive fencing really in Germany to the next level. And there are a few like, um, 
uh, I'm missing the word, like training sessions that go over a longer time. <laughs> yeah. So for like a week. And this uh, took actually place last year, or at least one for for five days. And that was already really great. The aim is to uh, participate in the IF FEMA tournament this year in like maybe last quarter, like COVID permits, and to really uh, push ourselves as fighters and as uh, competitive, competitive athletes. And I think it's really beneficial to just fans with these awesome people. <laughs> Yeah, no, definitely. Uh, that sounds like a really great opportunity and, a, and an honor. Um, it's it's cool that you're getting an opportunity to do that. And it's also very cool because you're going to be, uh, you know, participating under, uh, you know, a German federation doing Bolognese fencing. <laughs> yeah, but definitely. I... <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm the only one actually doing Bolognese fencing there. So uh, there's uh, uh, Björn Rüter. You probably know from his oh, yeah. uh, YouTube channel as well. He's also in the uh, national squad. He's doing Maya. And I think we are the only Renaissance guys in, in the men's carter at least. And yeah, all the other guys uh, pretty much do Lichtenauer. So it's uh, it's fun to to test our to test our sword fighting again. That. Yeah, no, it, it's a great experience too. Have you, um, what kind of uh, two-handed sword are you using? Do you have a two-handed sword that has lugs or um, are you using, what are you using right now for two-handed sword? Just a so uh, for competitive fencing, I of course use a feather. Mm -hmm. And uh, for my personal training in two-handed sword, um, I have a, like Renaissance long sword, which actually pretty much looks like a feather, but it's actually long sword in weight and uh, weight distribution. And Stefan has uh, uh, has an early Spadona as well, like the um, the one from Regenje, the you. early Spadona. Yeah, the uh, Spada Duimani, I think have he you calls seen it. The, have you seen the new Regenje Italian fetter? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it looks quite fun. It does look really fun. I, I mean, have you done any fencing with swords? I, I mean, like competitive. I know that with some of the bigger swords, it's kind of difficult. Mm -hmm. But have you done any sort of playful sparring or competitive sparring with two-handed swords that have the lugs on them? Yeah, so um, the Spada Duimani has some lugs. I wouldn't call them really lugs. I think these are pretty small. They aren't really a danger to a, to a training partner. So we tried and sparred uh, playfully with that sword it's also kind of wobbly so we'll have to see this summer how how it goes i really lo would love to to get my hand into like big zwei hander or like really a real spadona i have to see how my budget uh, permits it to get just another sword and also how my wife permits it <laughs> because actually uh, under my swords um all uh, lie under my bed so that's the most convenient place for me because then i just stand up i grab a sword and i start to train <laughs> <laughs> and it's actually getting kind of crowded in there <laughs> <laughs> yeah well you could always get a bigger bed <laughs> <laughs> that, that has to be the next step <laughs> so um the, the reason i was asking about lugs is because we've i've just recently, uh, we had some fetters made for us uh, from Historical Fencing Armory. Um, mm -hmm. And fighting with the lugs, and especially fighting people who do KDF, um, mm -hmm. it almost feels like I'm cheating. <laughs> <laughs> because they change the bind dynamic so much. Definitely. There's there's so many actions that they'll try to do on the sword where they'll try to do a Zornhauer or something like that. And they can't finish the Zornhau because when they try to push their point forward, it stops on the lugs and their point is still high. And I, it's, it's so great fighting those people with, you know, this, this weapon that kind of in some ways kind of represents this, uh, you know, a, a, a response to how, um, or it, what feels like a response to the way that uh, two handed sword fighting kind of progressed. Um, and uh, being able to sort of 
have that advantage and just kind of <laughs> dominate them with that sword it just feels so good um but i guess it's, it's really uh, it's really like a like a forward cross that like really protects your hand surprisingly well <laughs> yeah yeah i think Morato actually in his uh and his strata techniques for two-handed sword actually calls it the forward cross <laughs> um so you know and and it's really interesting when you look at his strata material because so much of it is uh, like in um, in KDF you have the wrenching right, mm -hmm. um, which is essentially where you'll take your your cross guard and you'll kind of wrench your opponent up and then perhaps go through and try to go for a grapple or something like that. Morazzo does the same things, but he does it essentially what he says would be at the forward cross. So he has one play where you end up doing wrenching. There's another one where you end up going for a, sort of a, a blade grab. Um, once their sword has fallen into your lugs, he says you grab up underneath the uh, the forward cross, and then go and essentially go for that disarm that Arto Pharma does so well. <laughs> uh, <laughs> oh, definitely. <laughs> but uh, you know, I, I, it's just it feels like such a it feels like carrying a machine gun in like the 1800s. You know, <laughs> it, it's just such a, an, an advancement in weaponry um, with something so simple. Yeah, definitely. And um, it's like uh, we see these weapons um, like an evolution of weapons and armor, depending on the, the context they were used in. That's really great, which really yeah. helps, uh, helps us to understand how these weapons actually were used. Yeah. And yeah, it's, it's, it's pretty fascinating. Um, you know, my one of my pet theories is that um, Lichtenauer actually learned most of his fighting in the Hundred Years' War and then came down <laughs> and was a mercenary in the Italian Wars, as most people were during the time. Um, I know that that rankles some people, but uh, that's my pet theory. <laughs> yeah, I like that. <laughs> Well, I mean, he says he traveled far and, or at least uh, Danzig says that he he traveled far and wide to learn the art. So we don't really know where he went. Some people think that he went up north and was fighting close to you in the Hussite Wars, right? Mm -hmm. um, and uh, and I I I think that there's much better combat going on in in Italy in the uh, in the late 1400s or mid 1400s. So that's where I like to put him. All right, man. Well, um, it's been absolutely awesome having you here. Um, do you have any final thoughts? Thank you first for having me. It was a real pleasure to talk with you and like really insightful as well. So it's, it's great to be here. I hope this podcast will actually inspire more people to just uh, pick up their video cam and record their training sessions. Like even their simplest sparring sessions, like their technique interpretations, don't be shy. It's all very much appreciated. Yeah, that's fantastic. I love that. That's uh, that's a great way to end this. Um, yeah, thanks again for coming on, and um, look forward to meeting you soon. Uh, hopefully, uh, we'll we'll get out of this pandemic, and uh, we'll be able to get together uh, and enjoy some fencing with one another. It's been a pleasure. Thank you, mate. Yeah. And that concludes another episode of Le Arte de Arme, the Bolognese podcast. I want to thank Martin for coming on again and sharing his wisdom with us. Next week's guest is going to be Jay Maxwell. Jay and I are going to banter back and forth about all the things that make Bolognese amazing and essential. So stay tuned for that and stay saucy, my friends. <laughs>